three, two, one. Ladies and gentlemen, Derek Ray is coming on to the podcast today. It's a pleasure and honor to have a legend of the beautiful game on a podcast. So for those who are unaware, Derek Ray is a leading football creator on ESPN and Fox Sports, Amazon Prime Video, as well as being one of the voices of Electronic Arts, FIFA 2021 game that just launched a week or so ago. How are you keeping, Derek? And are you right now? What's happening in your city the past one week? Well, first of all, thanks for the invitation. I'm well. I'm talking to you from the Boston area here in the USA, just to the north of Boston. And of course, it's election day today, so it's rather an important day. But we're in pandemic mode. We have been since March here. And what that means is from a professional point of view, I can't do what I usually do, which is travel a lot and cover football. But there are creative solutions for that. There are ways to be resourceful while you're in a pandemic. And that's really what we've been experiencing these past few months. Great. And of course, you know, it's an important day because the elections are ongoing. I think it has completed, right? And um, probably the results won't be out so soon, but uh, we are waiting with a better breath uh, to see the outcome of that. Today, we're going to talk about the elections. This is a non-political podcast. We're going to talk about the beautiful game, of course, and of course, about your commentating career. I have to do a confession, you know, because uh, you are one of my favorite sportsmen uh, in a particular order, okay? After Kenny Dalglish. Liverpool and Greg Sonus, Bill Shankly, Bob Paisley, Andy Robertson, you know, uh, who plays left back for my favorite club, Liverpool Football Club. And of course, the late, great uh, Sean Connery, the legendary uh, Scottish actor who made James Bond, James Bond, and uh, became a sought after senior actor, right? So his death you know, definitely still feels like a shock to a lot of people around the world because uh, it seems like he will stick around forever. So tell us whether you have met uh, Sean Connery be uh, previously, before, in during your career. No, I've never had the pleasure. I know a lot of people who have been in his company, but I've never had that pleasure myself. But extremely sad. Everybody in Scotland, very sad about the news that broke over the weekend, the passing of Sean Connery, one of the greats, one of the great Scots, no doubt about that. And he had a full life. He had a great life. And I think what people need to remember is he came really from nothing. He came from poverty and transformed his life through his acting ability and his force of personality. So, yeah, we are still mourning the loss of Sean Connery. I think it's very appropriate to maybe raise a farewell glass to one of the all-time greats, right? Sean Connery. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I'm not even sure where, you know, he grew up in Scotland, but I do know that you're from Aberdeen. Is that uh, the same hometown where he uh, grew up? Uh, I'm from Aberdeen, which is on the northeast coast of Scotland. Sean Connery was from Edinburgh, the capital, about two and a bit hours to the south. But we're a relatively small country, you know, certainly compared with where I live now in the USA. Uh, everything is pretty local in Scotland. So we're going to definitely move on and uh, you know, talk about uh, you being one of the most uh, instantly uh, recognizable commentary voices on uh, English language television. So, uh, you know, your work is so uh, familiar to us, uh, even in Asia, because uh, it's synonymous with uh, Champions League, you know, in the US as well, the Scottish Premiership and Bundesliga in the UK. And I think uh, you are still commentating you know, on the world feed for Bundesliga. So you launched your career with BBC Scotland, I believe, in the 80s. And uh, you're still a regular voice, you know, in, in uh, so many of these uh, fantastic leagues uh, that we follow, the beauty game. So I'm going to, you know, ask you about uh, how it started for you, you know, because I believe that uh, you did uh, spend a lot of time, uh, not just in UK, but in USA and Germany as well. So uh, recently you just, uh, you know, returned home to USA, home for you, yeah, USA. So are you thrilled to be back home in the USA? Well, it was a big decision to come back, and it was one that my wife and I had been discussing for a while. We were back in the UK for almost a decade. There were some opportunities there, and really there was some unfinished business from my point of view there too, because I had left at a relatively young age to come here to the USA. But no, it was for family reasons. It was because we had never sold our home here in the Boston area, and so there was always that desire to come back, and particularly when it emerged that I could do some of the things, some of the, the projects that I wanted to do really while being based here and still traveling. Now, the pandemic has rather got in the way of that. 
Um, and again, that's understandable because it's where we are as a world at the moment. But no, very much enjoy where I live. I can walk to the ocean in about five minutes from my front door. Uh, we have great summers here. We have wonderful autumns. The winter can be a bit bleak for somebody who's not used to the winter here. It's long and it's cold and it's icy and it's snowy and it's a bit too long for many people. But I always think it's worth it. You've got to pay the price for a nice summer uh, by having this long, harsh winter. And no, I, I love where I live. And to be honest, I've been here most of my adult life. So it very much is home, even though I will always be Scottish. Scotland is where I was brought up. It's where my parents, my family still live. But um, there will always be uh, a big part of me that will say that home is uh, Boston as well as Scotland. So Boston is definitely a place that, uh, you know, is quite familiar to many Liverpool fans around the world, including me. So you could you could tell straight away I'm not a, I'm a non-neutral football fan, yeah. And uh, of course, uh, Fenway, you know, Park is uh, quite famous, of course, uh, in that part of the world. And uh, do you have a lot of memories as a regular attending, you know, Boston Red Sox games at uh, Fenway Park? I do. Uh, when I first came to Boston as a tourist in the late 1980s, it was one of the things that attracted me to the area was the sports culture and specifically the baseball culture. Now, I'm a football commentator, not a baseball commentator. But in those days, I really wanted to get to know the area better. And then when I moved here in the early 90s, it was one of the things that I did almost, I'm not going to say every night, but once a week, I would turn up at Fenway Park. And in those days, you could actually actually get very easily a uh, day of game tickets and they didn't cost that much. I'm talking here about bleacher seats. The bleacher seats are the seats um, sort of way at the, you know, in the, the outer part of the stadium, not the best views at all, but you could get these seats at the last minute. I was a single at the time. So I, I would go on my own and I would, turn up at the ticket office and I would say, do you have any tickets? And they usually would have, you know, single tickets. So I did that quite a lot. And my memories of that team would have been around people like Roger Clemens, the great pitcher, Wade Boggs, the third baseman and, um, you know, excellent hitter and um, people of that ilk. Um, Tom Brunanski, who was the, the slugger of the time, Alice Burks, who was another one uh, who was excellent. So, yeah, I mean, I, I really used baseball as a way of getting more familiar with American sports culture, but also American culture generally, because it did strike me that you could understand a lot about the USA through the sport of baseball, and especially in an area like New England, where there is such a passion for the Boston Red Sox. And remember, in those days, they weren't the successful Red Sox that they've become in the last few years. Yeah, it's an incredible story how, you know, they managed to actually clinch the title right after so many years, you know, in, in oblivion. And of course, uh, Fenway, you know, uh, sports group, I think uh, Liverpool fans are familiar with them. Uh, they played a huge part in that as well. We're not going to talk about baseball today. Uh, um, maybe just delve uh, deeper into your career because uh, you're very fascinating to me and uh, not just because you have a distinct voice and, uh, you know, I worship you just like I worship Martin Tyler and John Martin, you know. You mentioned earlier about your stint in Germany as well, right? Or In fact, now you're still, uh, you know, uh, commentating on Bundesliga games. So what is it about you and Germany? I understand that you speak uh, fluent German and uh, conversing with someone like Jürgen Klopp shouldn't be a uh, big of a challenge, right? Oh, I would love the chance to have a chat with Jurgen Klopp. Uh, I always hear him being interviewed in English nowadays, but I, I similarly uh, enjoy listening to him when he talks to German broadcasters. Yeah, I mean, the German language thing goes back to my youth in Aberdeen and a realization at a young age that I was pretty fascinated with Germany. And it goes back to the 1974 World Cup in West Germany. I was seven years of age at the time. And I remember I was bombarding my parents with questions about German culture and uh, geography and where is this city in relation to this other city and what's this known for. And then a couple of years later, when we started learning languages at my primary school, I was in the class that took German. There was one class that did French and the other that did German. So I happened to be in the right class for my own interests. And I realized early on that it 
came quite naturally to me that it just really spoke to me, the language. And it actually helps being Scottish because a lot of the sounds that we make organically in Scotland, you know, the, the R and the H, those sounds which mo most other people and other languages struggle to make, we just do it intuitively. Um, but obviously it's a very complicated language and it was one that just really struck a chord with me. And I realized that because I lived in Aberdeen, and if you go on a map and have a look at where Aberdeen is, we're right on the coast, right on the North Sea coast. And if you were to take a boat from Aberdeen and travel, you know, southeast, you would eventually come to the port of Hamburg in Germany, not that far as the crow flies. So it meant I could listen to German radio. Uh, on medium wave back in the 1970s. And that had the effect of making my German even better. But also, it made me sort of wake up to the world of the Bundesliga because I realized I could listen to broadcasts of the Bundesliga from my home in Aberdeen in German. And so I did that. I probably was the only kid in, in uh, anywhere in Scotland who was doing that sort of thing at the time. But um, German was my best subject. I went on to study it at university. I spent some time there assisting at a local comprehensive school back in the mid-1980s, right on the border with East Germany. So this was West Germany, right on the border. When I say right on the border, I mean, you know, 10 meters away was the border. And you could see the East German border guards from their watchtower looking in at the West. That's how sort of close and eerie it was. So So Germany was a big part of my upbringing. And I'm just so thrilled I've been able to continue that relationship now as a broadcaster, especially in recent years, going regularly to Germany to work for the Bundesliga's World Feed as one of their main commentary voices. This is fantastic. It's absolutely brilliant. And of course, uh, we want to really you know, find out how did it all begin for you? Was it in Aberdeen that you started making tapes as a young lad? Or how, how did you decide to become like a sports broadcaster? Was it like even a viable career, you know? During the days of, uh, you know, in the 70s or the 80s, uh, you know, instead of picking a nine to five job, either as a teacher or an educator, when did you actually get your big break? Well, I'll tell you the story. I began making tapes from 1974 on. That was the year I mentioned the World Cup in West Germany. That was the year when our family bought its first stereo cassette recorder. What's a stereo cassette recorder? People always ask me, people who are younger than, than I am. Well, it was a revolutionary device. It allowed me to put my voice on tape and I would impersonate the commentators. And then I got a portable version of the same thing and I would begin just walking around with it and talking into it and commentating on football matches in the park, at school, other places around town. And then I plucked up the courage to take that tape recorder with me to uh, a local reserve game of Aberdeen, my local team and then to a first team game with fans around me. And so I'd have the atmosphere of the fans to work off as I was commentating. So I was doing all this, you know, while I was, you know, 10, 11, 12, which sounds bizarre in, in retrospect, but clearly I really wanted to do it and I had a passion for it. And I then one day on a whim, I sent a tape of my work from an Aberdeen first team game to David Francie, who was my idol. He was, was my hero uh, in terms of commentators around at that time. He was a Scottish voice. He was the voice of Scottish football on the radio. So I sent him this tape, care of the BBC in Glasgow, not thinking I would really get a reply, but I did. It was a beautiful reply um, saying he had enjoyed my tape and really wanted to encourage me gave me some tips that he uses, some vocal tips, and we sort of stayed in touch over a number of years. And then um, I was 19 in 1986. I was at the University of Aberdeen. I'd been working for Hospital Radio, which is a voluntary service in the UK for hospital patients, but it gives broadcasters a chance to get some more practical experience. And I did this for a number of years, covering all the Aberdeen games. And these were the years when Aberdeen were the best team in Europe, when they beat Bayern in the quarterfinal of the Cup Winners' Cup, Real Madrid in the final, won the Super Cup against Hamburg. A fellow called Alex Ferguson, who is hugely popular with Liverpool fans, I know, was our manager. Um, but they were great days, and I learned so much. But I, I sent another tape to David Francie, my idol, in 1986. And this time, and it tells you everything about him, instead of giving me more advice, he gave the tape to his bosses. And they um, contacted me 
and said, we would really like to have you down in Glasgow. We'd like to put you on the air. To cut a long story short, they did. I got my break when David was unavailable for a game because of a knee injury. It was a Kilmarnock against Dumbarton game in 1986 on the radio. And that was the start of my professional career. And I stayed at the BBC for five years. My second game on the year was England against Scotland at Wembley. Can you imagine a 19-year-old wow. getting that opportunity nowadays? Second game on the year was, was England-Scotland, the oldest international fixture of them all. I'm just very grateful. I was lucky. You have to be lucky in this business. You have to get a big break at the right time. And that was my one. And as the people would normally say, the rest is history, right? And of course, uh, you took us down a trip uh, down memory lane when you mentioned about Aberdeen being a soccer football powerhouse in Europe. And you mentioned about Alex Ferguson, our favorite uh, manager. <laughs> yeah. Know? Right. So uh, definitely I have to ask you the next question because we know that the uh, Rangers uh, football club, they are crushing it in the Scottish Premier League right now. And uh, do you think they will ever, you know, return to being a European powerhouse as well? I think like, Steven Gerrard, right, is really creating lots of waves in the Scottish Premier League right now and leading to Rangers where they are right now, seven points clear of Celtic. Do you think or do you see that the Scottish League, you know, will be back, you know, in the limelight and joining the top 10 European leagues anytime soon? Well, certainly the results have been better in Europe from both Rangers and Celtic in the last couple of years. I think it's difficult, though. I think we have to temper it with a bit of realism. We're a small country in the European context, and the money is not there. And a lot of it comes down to the money from TV deals. And part of the problem is that Scottish TV deals are made by English broadcasters. I used to work for one of them. And the priority is not necessarily... Uh, in the Scottish League. That's just a fact of life. You know, whereas a lot of the other small countries, say the Netherlands or Belgium, they have Dutch people and Belgian people actually putting that league first. In the UK, you don't have that so much. So as big as Rangers and Celtic are, and they are mammoth clubs, I mean, they are huge football clubs who consume so much um, you know, interest from people on a day-to-day -day basis. But as big as they are in the context of Scotland within the UK, um, it, it's just quite difficult. So I, I think that there will be seasons where we'll see, you know, upticks and we'll see good form, such as we're seeing so far from Rangers anyway, uh, both domestically and in Europe in the current campaign. There will be seasons like that, but we also have, will have to endure more difficult campaigns but you know again it goes back to what i said these are two big clubs aberdeen um you know my club we were a big power in the 1980s not so much now and it's not realistic for us really to think that 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 we can compete on that basis either um but you know i think that it really depends on where european football goes in the next few years and on the changes that are made but in the current structure Scotland sort of is where it is, and it's a matter of whether it can, you know, some years creep closer towards that top 10 that you mentioned, while being realistic enough to know that there'll be other years when uh, it might be down closer to 14, 15, 16, 17. That's brilliant and uh, great insights, especially on the Scottish Premier League, which, you know, I haven't really followed other than, you know, occasionally, uh, you know, just uh, look at the table and see how Steven Gerrard's uh, Drangers are doing, you know, and uh, it's definitely very hard, I think, to see that he's doing well there. And uh, we're going to maybe uh, segue into, uh, you know, uh, next question, which uh, I think is very appropriate to squeeze in questions about COVID-19 and how it yep. has affected you, you know, uh, as a commentator as well. Mm -hmm. I understand that now, you know, it's no longer possible, right, to travel to Germany or to even, you know, uh, visit the great stadiums in Germany and commentate about the Bundesliga games. And uh, you have to probably do a lot of uh, commentating work at home right now. So maybe tell us, you know, how different is it uh, to commentate either on closed door games or games with limited fans or even like doing it from home? Uh, do you uh, still love the sport, like doing virtual commentating as much as when you're surrounded by, you know, fans in the commentating booth? Well, there's no substitute for being at the venue and with fans around you and, you know, with full stadia. But we all recognize we're in a pandemic and it affects every single person. Um, so I'm not alone as a commentator and we're all having to do things out of necessity, out of, uh, you know, care for society as a whole that would not be our first choice. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, I long for the day when I can get back to Germany in front of a full stadium, but I only long for that day when it's safe for us as a society to do that. So I'm not trying to 
to wish the pandemic away. I mean, we, we would all maybe like to do that, but we can't. You know, it's, it's just not realistic. So that's where you have to be creative. And yeah, I mean, it's not the same commentating on a game with no fans. I've done many such games down the years. I, I've always <laughs> found them particularly uh, unenjoyable because you do, as a commentator, work off the what I call the oohs and ahs of the fans, you know, and you know all about that from from Anfield. Uh, it's a great example of it where you have that built-in soundtrack as a commentator that you can rely on. You know that when a particular, you know, if Andy Robertson fires in a shot from 35 yards out and it just shaves the crossbar, you know, you can call the player's name as a commentator and then you get that ah sound, you know, from the cop. And um, you know exactly what I'm talking about when I say that. So, um, 100%, yes. Yeah, yeah. And that applies to, to you know, every football club, every um, situation in the world. So, uh, you know, I, I've just tried to get on with my work. Now, I work for ESPN as well on the Bundesliga. I'm actually, as we speak now, going down to their headquarters on Saturday to broadcast the big one in Germany, which, as you know, is Borussia Dortmund against Bayern. And that goes ahead on Saturday. So I'll be broadcasting that for US viewers from ESPN with a very limited staff in place, essentially really just only the people who are actually working on the game. So it's a handful uh, in a socially distanced uh, environment and uh, all hygiene protocols in place. But uh, most of my work for the last few months has been from home, from here, from this very office. And I think it's going to be realistically that way for quite some time and you know people say oh it's such a shame you can't get back to germany and i say don't feel sorry for me you know i've had some great trips and I, I hope i'll have some great trips again in the future but we're all having to just buckle down um, hunker down especially here in this uh, american winter that we're about to embark upon and um, do our thing in as safe a way as possible this is fantastic. And of course, I think it's only appropriate uh, to maybe uh, open up uh, my favorite website, which is, uh, of course, uh, ESPN website, where I go there. You know, it's my go-to uh, channel uh, when I want to look at the latest uh, results and uh, football news. So uh, it's also where you're writing, you know, a weekly column, right, on the Bundesliga, on ESPN FC, uh, on the website as well. So maybe, you know, uh, what is your hot take on this particular News that I'm sharing right now hopefully appears on your screen. It's basically, you know, with a headline that uh, Ajax is uh, missing 11 players ahead of a Champions League clash uh, with positive COVID-19 tests. So I think this is uh, one of the headlines on, on the ESPN website right now. And it's definitely concerning to uh, Liverpool fans like me, you know, because tonight they're traveling to Atlanta. And, you know, with the news that 11 players from Ajax are are tested positive for, for COVID, it starts to worry me a lot. It's like, shouldn't we pause the Champions League right now when, you know, uh, there are double-digit positive cases, especially throwing, you know, into Liverpool's, uh, you know, team group into this array right now with so many cases. And obviously, they recently been to Bergamo, which is where Atalanta played their home games, right? Uh, I think it's one of the cities that are greatly ravaged by COVID-19 with, I think, the most number of deaths as well in Italy. So, what do you think? What is your hot take on that? Do you think that uh, Champions League should be put into a stop uh, as and when, you know, cases are spiking? You know, I wrestle with this all the time and not just with regard to the Champions League, but uh, when looking at all fixtures, you know, I, I think that football, let's just say one thing. I think football has done a good job of coming up with a hygiene concept that can work in a pandemic. Now, to me, that really at the moment, certainly from a European perspective, means no fans. I don't think we can ha be having fans inside the stadium. It sends the wrong, the wrong signal for the moment um, until such time as numbers come considerably down. Because you've got to think about the, um, the arrival at the stadium, the departure. It's not just saying, OK, we'll have socially distanced fans inside a stadium. How do you get them there? Uh, what is going to be the temptation to kind of go back to old times with your friends before the game and after the game and things like that. And, you know, we don't want football to be the cause of infections. Now, with regard to the players, of course, they have their own concept and they are to an extent in their own bubble. But you do get a bit worried when you see the Ajax story and indeed stories at other clubs. And I can only sort of try to imagine what the players are going through at the moment, because these are not normal times. They are getting on with it, but knowing that there is a risk involved. And, 
you know, I, I've heard people say, well, they're young and they're not affected by it to the extent that, you know, somebody of, I'm 53, somebody of my age might be. Uh, but at the same time, we don't know enough about COVID. And, you know, I read a lot about the uh, the long COVID story and the long haulers and people um, who've had this for several months. And we don't yet know about the long-term impact of this novel virus. So I'm sort of on the cautious side when it comes to this. And I, I do hope and I do believe that football is looking very closely at it. I have my reservations, I have to tell you about international football in the current climate you know we have an international break coming up hot on the heels of a previous international break in october and that did seem to um lead to more infections amongst players i think there's no doubt about that players were taken away from their bubble um they were sometimes traveling independently to get to uh, venues to play for their countries new people come into the mix so travel um, movements, you know, these are the things that epidemiologists will tell us uh, are, are very bad in a pandemic. So um, I, I think as long as it's contained within one club, and, and obviously Ajax represents one club, then it's still doable, but it has to always be case by case. And if we get to the stage where it is out of control in any particular club, and it does seem as though it, it is if you have 11 cases at Ajax, uh, then caution is called for. Yeah, I do remember the game in Anfield where Atletico Madrid, right, they came yep. to visit and uh, it was a game that should be caught up because uh, I think Liverpool, the city, became a hot spot in the UK after the game. So it was... Yeah. Uh, well, I'll, 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 yeah. I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a story about that week. I was supposed to be in England that week. I was meant to be in England. Actually, my wife and I were going to go to Spain for a couple of days beforehand and then I was going to be doing some work in England and also in Germany. About mm, 10 days before that trip, having spoken to many people who I know in the medical world and the epidemiology world specifically, I canceled that trip. I said, we, we, this is not going to happen. This, this makes no sense um, in the current climate. I was stunned by that week in the UK as a whole, how many things still were going ahead. And that Liverpool game was one example. And if you look at the footage of Jurgen Klopp, when, if you remember, some fans tried to high five him, and you could see the sort of the, the concern on his face because Jurgen Klopp is a very well-read, intelligent guy. You know, he's somebody who is a terrific football manager, but he's also somebody who, you know, reads the news. He's also somebody who has a wider perspective and thinks about people. And I think he saw what was about to, to happen. Uh, you know, we, we had that week in the UK, we had the big um, horse racing meeting, the Cheltenham Festival, 50,000 people cheek by jowl. Um, uh, watching horse racing. And I was observing all this from back here in the USA, having canceled my trip. And I followed the German news every day. I followed the UK news. And Germany seemed to get it a bit earlier, uh, understanding that they had to pull back. Um, but in the UK, there was a, an element of denial up until that weekend. And as we know, in a pandemic, every day counts. I think that it's uh, worrying, uh, especially, uh, of course, uh, for broadcasters as well and uh, those yeah. who are, you know, doing TV production work. Of course, uh, when games are cancelled, it's not, never a good thing because that means that uh, uh, many things have to be paused as well, like work and career. So, you know, in terms of like uh, this COVID-19, you know, uh, many people, uh, especially, you know, they're going through difficult times, or even marketers, you know, some, most of our audience are marketers, uh, they are in senior marketing positions as well, and they need to pivot and to adapt and then to grow and evolve, you know, during a pandemic, uh, during unpredictable times. So what's your message or advice for those who are facing challenges during, you know, this pandemic times? So we know that, you know, you have pivoted successfully and uh, you are even doing, you know, video game commentary, lending a voice, and you are a big part of what, you know, uh, EA Sports are doing with their newly launched game, which is FIFA 2021. We're going to maybe talk a little bit about that later sure. on. What's the advice for people who are facing challenges during the pandemic? The advice I would give, and maybe it's not applicable to everybody, is be creative. What I did during the pandemic was when I realized I didn't have the usual work, I didn't have as many things um, on my calendar uh, that I would normally have you know in an average year in a normal year uh, i began to sort of branch out and and i tried to use social media to for example spread the gospel in terms of the bundesliga because the bundesliga came back before 
any other major league. And I realized that all of a sudden you had people around the world who weren't that familiar with the Bundesliga, who wanted some knowledge because they were going to watch some games. So I decided to do this little thing on social media, which I called Back Garden Bundesliga. It was just me talking into a camera on my iPad in the back garden with some nice scenery as you know spring began to, to blossom in this area. And it was one of the best things I've ever done. And it was good for me, but it was also, I think, well received by people, um, you know, just viewing it. And, you know, there's an example of something that you can do. You can do it costs nothing. It didn't necessarily, you know, turn into anything for me that was, you know, tangibly um, a business success, but maybe it did because um, it certainly got me a lot of followers, new followers who, from people who wanted to understand the Bundesliga more and maybe people who uh, just had an interest in something new and, and a bit different. Um, but, uh, you know, I would say, go ahead and look at things like that. What can you do to make yourself stand out? You know, I think that's what it's all about. Certainly in my business, you know, you can do what everybody else is doing. I make a point, for example, of when I tweet on social media and especially during the pandemic, I could tweet about the things everybody else is tweeting about, you know, and I deliberately don't tweet about the Premier League very much, even though I watch it and follow it. I just sort of think there are enough people who are doing that. So I always look for an angle that is a bit different, um, that plays to my particular passions. And I think that's what everybody should be thinking about. What are you passionate about and what can you do to make that passion sing, so to speak, and create interest from other people? Um, because the one thing I do know as somebody who's been a commentator since 1986 professionally, it's something I'm very passionate about. If you can make a living through doing something that you're passionate about, it's always going to have a chance of being a bigger success than if you're going into something that you're half-hearted about. So, you know, just have a think about that. I know it's difficult because we are in a pandemic and we can't always, um, you know, make something happen in the way that we would like. But the one thing that a lot of us do have at the moment or have had is time. And so use that time, come up with a plan, you know, trial and error. Sometimes you try something and it doesn't work, but use that time to good effect. I absolutely love that piece of advice. I think it applies to, uh, you know, many people from across the many verticals and fields, even for a podcaster like me, you know, these are mm. great tips, you know, on how to actually navigate this uh, pandemic and uh, still being uh, creative and productive at the same time while doing what you love. I think that's uh, the most important thing. And uh, we're going to maybe, uh, move on to the next topic. And obviously as a Liverpool fan, right, that Milan, Liverpool, Champions League oh. final in 2005, yep. still, you know, uh, uh, on top of memory, you know, and whenever I, you get a chance to talk to uh, people who watch a game or people comment on a game, people like you, you know, I have to ask you this question. Is that the greatest game that you ever covered? And uh, has there been any sports game that you commented uh, on that got close enough to that game, either in the Bundesliga or in the NFL, were you also checking, you know, record margin of victory, you know, in the Chelsea final during halftime when Milan were leading Liverpool by 3-0? to zero? Um, Milan-Liverpool, I think, will forever be the greatest game that I have commentated on. I'll be surprised if that gets topped at some stage. You never know, but I, I would be surprised. And I said that at the time when I walked out of the stadium in Istanbul in Turkey that night. I said to my production team, we have just witnessed a piece of history, the like of which we will never experience. And people will talk about this game for decades to come, you know, long after we are gone people will remember Milan against Liverpool in 2005. And so as a commentator, you just have to soak that in and do your job. And it was actually easier to do the job that night than almost in, in any other game because the action was just all there in front of you. It flowed as a story. How could you not do justice to that? And you're right, at halftime, I was a bit worried because uh, I thought, you know, I've travelled all this way from the east coast of the USA to the Bosphorus, the banks of the Bosphorus in Turkey, and we're going to have the most one-sided final in European club history. It certainly appeared that was going to be the case at half time, But lo and behold, Liverpool produced that comeback of all comebacks, and then the nail-biting drama of the penalty shootout. And yeah, I just count myself very lucky to have been in position to put words to those images and a lot of people in the USA, you know, who were maybe high school students at that time or early college years, they contact me quite regularly and say that it was that 
game that turned them onto the sport of football, that maybe they had a vague awareness of it beforehand, but it was live on ESPN in the USA and around the world in many other territories around the world. And, you know, people switched that on. And from that point on, it sort of became regular viewing. There were those who had discovered it before, of course, but um, it does seem to have become a bit of important nostalgia for people in the USA who might now be in their, you know, early to mid thirties at that time were just young people discovering the sport. So yeah, I, I, I doubt very much that I'll ever get a game to top that one. The one that has come closest was actually in Germany and it was as recently as three years ago. And it was the biggest derby in the country between Borussia Dortmund and Schalke. And that is my favorite derby in the world. I was very excited that day. I was in Dortmund for the game. Uh, you know, you never quite know how that derby is going to go, irrespective of form. And Borussia Dortmund, much like Milan all those years prior, raced into a 4-0 lead at half time. So Schalke were down and out, and I was doing the same thing, looking at what the biggest margin of victory was at a derby. And uh, Schalke did what Liverpool did, and actually you could say did better because they came from 4-0 down to draw 4-4 with uh, Naldo, their Brazilian defender, equalizing with virtually the last kick of the game. And it finished 4-4 in the biggest derby, Di Muta a la Derbys, as they say in Germany, the mother of all derbies. And so that was the one that has come closest to reminding me of Milan-Liverpool. Had I not done Milan-Liverpool, I would have said that Dortmund schalke game would be number one. But of course, it was a regular season Bundesliga match, not a final. It was this huge derby. Uh, so I'd have to put that number two. But uh, Milan-Liverpool forever number one, I suspect. I don't think it'll ever be beaten. At least I'll be surprised if it is. Oh, these are absolutely, you know, brilliant, beautiful game, you know, that, uh, you know, I haven't watched that uh, the derby game. So I'm going to hunt down footage of you commentating on that game. Yeah. As well, because four four seems like an incredible score, and uh, I definitely want to check that out. And of course, you know, uh, as uh, someone who is a podcaster, I'm always very fascinated, fascinated by the kind of work that goes behind, you know, your preparations uh, for your broadcast for a match. Uh, so, yep. what kind of work, you know, goes on behind the scenes uh, during matches uh, for you? Um, for example, as well, you know the the running stats that commentators are always, you know, using during the broadcast as well. Where do you guys get your sources from? And uh, what are your favorite sources when you're commentating on a football game? Well, it really depends on the league that you're covering and it depends on the, the go-to sources in each league. Um, as I say, I work in Germany a lot nowadays and the Bundesliga itself has an excellent stats pack that is given to commentators before every game and you know we scour it for hours and hours and come up with our favorites from you know what is a, a pretty long list and that's actually the challenge is finding the things that are relevant rather than things that are just stats for the sake of stats because you can uh you know you can douse a game in stats and and ruin it through that so it's a matter of um you know a, a bit of seasoning with stats rather than making it the whole dish you know to use kind of uh, the cooking analogy and um so you know i have my own favorite sources uh, that I, I go online and use a lot of german publications as well independent of the bundesliga if i'm working in england then uh, there they tend to have some very good experienced statisticians who will work for the channels that you're working for and they will give us a, a big dossier before the game. And it, it'll take quite a long time to go through it all similarly, but it's very well done. And I don't think that is beaten anywhere else in the world. And it'll have some quirky things that you didn't realize, some newsy stats as well as some numerical stats. And really as a commentator, it's a matter of organizing it in such a way that you have it all memorized. It's like um, studying for an exam. You know, it's like studying for an exam, knowing that the exam date is Saturday and you just have to have it all in your head by the time the exam comes around. I've actually got here on my, my work table. I'll just show you. This is not finished. This is just the start of my my work for the weekend on uh, yeah. Dortmund and uh, Bayern. And so I've done most of my player stuff. That's the, the, the stuff you can see on the top. So Dortmund in black and Bayern in red and then some historical stuff here and i'm probably going to fill in most of the the actual um factoid stuff 
today, tomorrow, uh, you know, the days leading up to Saturday. So I've still got time on my side to do all that. Um, but that's my routine for every game is that one sheet. And people say, why do you do it all on one sheet and why do you hand write it? Well, it goes back to really my um, my generation, if you like, because I didn't grow up with a computer. I use computers nowadays, but I did everything handwritten. And there is something when you learn languages, it's often said that if you handwrite something, it does actually help you with learning languages more than using computers. There's something about the um, writing things down, and I use color code as well, as you can see there, um, but writing things down and that being implanted in the memory. Uh, because I think most of us uh, are, do have photographic memory. So in other words, if we write something down, we have this vague um, sort of chip that's that's put in our brains, and we remember when we wrote it down and, and what the context of that was. So um, uh, this is getting very scientific now, but, but that's how I do it, and, and that's how I've always done it. But the other reason for one sheet was that in my early days, in Scotland, we didn't have huge press boxes. In fact, the commentary position was, you know, really, you know, tight with no elbow room at all. So I'd have somebody sitting here, somebody sitting next to me, and, you know, no table in front of you. So you really had to organize your work in such a way that you had access to it. And so the idea of taking, you know, seven sheets of paper and spreading them out over a table, no, that's not going to work. And actually, that doesn't work anyway, because if you have too many sheets of paper, then how do you access it all? How do you know where it is? So really, I have it all on the one bit of paper. My goal is to almost never use it during the game because I've memorized it. But you organize it in such a way that if you do need to use it, maybe at half time or maybe in a break and play, then you know intuitively where everything is on the sheet. So that's my system. Uh, if you talk to 10 other commentators, they will have 10 different systems. There is not one uniform system that works for everybody, which really is just a way of saying that we all learn subtly differently. This is fantastic. And, uh, you know, I, I tend to have a similar, you know, um, tactics as well, as in I also write a lot, but I don't write on a piece of paper anymore. I use it on my iPad and I have an Apple pen, so yep. then that helped me to actually, you know, remember things better because, uh, you know, having to memorize too many stats is actually near impossible, right? So writing it down, like what you said, I think is a great advice for any young, you know, uh, commentator who's hoping to you know, break into the industry. So yep. thanks for the advice and the great insights sure. as well. You know, how I wish you had more time uh, to continue, you know, to uh, bombard you with a dozen more questions, especially on production value engineering and how you do your research as well but because of the lack of time i think i'll just uh, maybe do a rapid fire round and uh, bombard you with maybe half a dozen questions before we sure. end this podcast yep. so are you ready try not to overthink your answers okay i'll give you very quick short answers I'll, I'll i'll you know tell you what comes into my head when you pose the question let's go were there any commentators you particularly looked up to when you started out David Francie in Scotland and the late Brian Moore in England on ITV. They were the two. Um, great respect for so many others, but they were the two that I would say were the standouts for me. Fantastic choice. Those were my heroes as well. What is the favorite stadium you've been in? Favorite stadium is the Signali Duna Park, the Westfalenstadion in Dortmund. I've often said that if I could pick the venue for my game of departure, if you like, my last game, hopefully it's many years from now, um, that is the one I would choose. It is my favorite. The yellow wall is a sight to yeah. behold, right? That is my dream destination as well to attend a football game. Okay, next one. Moving quickly, if football didn't exist, what would you be doing instead? I think I would be a translator or a language teacher. I suspect probably a translator working for an international organization. What are some of the notable differences you've seen commentating for an American versus a British audience? Not huge differences. I think that context is always important and you have to understand who your audience is. But by and large, I would say it's a very knowledgeable audience in the USA. And I might explain one or two things for the US audience uh, that I might not have to explain for a European audience. Uh, just And sometimes that can be geography or history. But really, it's the same job. And I don't overthink that too much, apart from just understanding who my audience is, what they already know, what they might not know. But the main thing is to say something that is memorable and something, hopefully, uh, along the line that makes them smile somewhere. Next one. If you could have called any match from footballing history, which would you choose and why? 
The one I would have loved to call would have been the 1974 World Cup final between West Germany and the Netherlands. Now, it wasn't the greatest final of all time, but just because I lived that as a young viewer, it's the first World Cup I can remember, and I can still picture Gerd Müller scoring his goal, typical Müller goal, and then celebrating sort of like a jack-in-the-box, you know, jumping all over the pitch. And just to have been able to have my words on that final. I think I think that is the one just because I was such an impressionable seven-year-old at the time and was discovering this magical world of international football. So yeah, West Germany, Netherlands, 1974. Brilliant choice. Let's squeeze in one last one. How fun is it to work with Tommy Smith? Great fun. He is one of the great characters in broadcasting. He is one of the cleverest broadcasters I've ever worked with. People don't give him enough credit for that. He has his own style. He's his own man. He's never been afraid to be that. And he's a friend. I'm you know, so proud to call him a friend and a colleague and somebody who you know, has been a big part of my broadcasting career as well as a partner. And I have to say, it's been fun doing this podcast together with you. It's, it has been effortless, you know, because you're a great communicator and you're so generous to share, you know, so many advice and tips as well. So thank you for coming on to the podcast. You gave us so much insights, your philosophy, your advice, your communication skills and your incredible work, you know, for EA Sports, ESPN, and Amazon Prime Video, especially your humility. I think that's something that uh, not many people know, but I discovered, you know, after talking to you for the past 45 minutes. So well, um, thank you so much. And uh, for those out there, my audience, uh, our audience uh, who are worshipping people like you, Martin Tyler, John Watson, right? Uh, you're definitely, you know, a person that we should follow on Twitter as well. You mentioned about Twitter earlier. Tell us your Twitter handle. Well, thank you for having me on, Wayne. Yes, my Twitter handle is at Raycom. So that's at R-A-E-C-O-M-M at Raycom on Twitter. And yeah, you can find me there and I talk a lot about football and broadcasting and many other things. So would love to have your company there. This is fantastic. And I love following your LinkedIn post as well. So uh, Twitter or LinkedIn, that's uh, various yep. ways to reach out to him. And of course, uh, thank you once again. And uh, please keep yourself safe and uh, take care of each other Yeah, over there. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. Stay safe, be well, and keep in touch. See ya. Goodbye. So that's Derek Ray. And uh, to listen to more episodes, make sure you subscribe to our podcast on Apple, Spotify, and Google. So you can just simply search CMO Asia Podcast and you'll find us easily once you're subscribed. Uh, you'll also be able to get new episodes on your smartphone or iPads or computers as soon as we publish them. So uh, please don't forget to submit your reviews and comments as well. Uh, this is uh, highly appreciated uh, by me. So uh, I'll see you guys at the next uh, podcast live stream where I think we have someone from Microsoft who's a data scientist. Uh, who will come on and share with us her unique journey and story. So until then, keep yourself safe. Uh, do take care of yourself and take care of each other. Goodbye, everybody. Wayne Chung signing off.